So wait, is this episode 40 this time? I think we did that last time. I think this is 41. Catching up to ourselves. Mm -hmm. Hi, welcome back to the People's Guide to Publishing podcast, volume 41. 41. 41. And going. I am your former host, Joe Beal, the uh, autistic publisher and author of A People's Guide to Publishing, the book. Former host? <laughs> Time <laughs> will tell. Time will tell. Do we have a new, new host here now? Here now. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see how this episode goes. Carry on. No, 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 go on. After you. Who are, who are you? I am the former host. I was the host for one minute. Oh. I'm Ellie Blue. I'm the marketing and editorial director at Microcosm. And today's topic is the bestseller list. Dun, dun, dun. Which is strangely something we've never talked about on this podcast before, and B, something we've never been on before last week. So we have this little book, Unfuck Your Brain, Little Yellow Beauty, very popular. Mm -hmm. And we accidentally participated in an ebook promotion a few weeks ago. We didn't really think much of it until it we ended up being number 10 on the top selling nonfiction ebooks of the Wall Street Journal bestseller list, an entity which I had forgotten existed, I have to confess. They, we learned so many things, so many things we've had theories about, so many things we've had opinions about. Like, you can run your entire launch strategy to land yourself on these lists. And 99% of the time, you will fail. Unless you have way too much money, in which case, I would question what the point is of publishing a book in the first place. I feel like you've summarized it all. Maybe we should just call and it a wrap. And end. <laughs> Um, so yeah, the New York Times bestseller list and the Wall Street Journal bestseller list, are there any others that are important? Um, the, the Guardian list, the USA Today list, okay. um, there's, everybody has a list that thinks they're an important, uh, newspaper of note. Newspapers, they like to make lists, and mm -hmm. some of them, well, they're supposedly lists of, like, the books that have sold the most copies that week. Mm -hmm. um, the Wall Street Journal actually does kind of try to do that. They just go based on the Nielsen book scan data, which does capture, like, a certain kinds of sales and not other kinds of sales. But yeah. it does capture sales. Mm -hmm. And apparently it captured our sales of this ebook. And so, you know, in general, the thinking, the conventional thinking is that when you land on one of these lists, ideally it would be the New York Times list, you will attract so much attention that people will buy your book just because it's on the list, because that will convince them that one, it's good, two, you know, they should read it. When I worked at a bookstore in the 90s, the very most prominent display area in the store was given to that week's New York Times bestsellers. Yeah. And people would buy the heck out of them and I would always stand there across from them like from my checkout station being like why would anyone buy that book right much less so many people you know we've long like disinvested ourselves from these lists and trying to land on these lists because it's just a waste of time and you know the amount of resources and strategy necessary to do this is at great resource expense for our basic operations and you know like actually selling books through conventional means which is honestly any way we can so you know also notable the lists do not record 90 some percent of what our sales would be in a typical week which would be any kind of specialty store any kind of gift store any kind of non-reporting retailer which is you know microcosm's customers yeah, like I see placement on a bestseller list as like a nice to have, but definitely not a must have and definitely not even something we expect or try, as you said. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people, their entire publishing strategy is based on trying to get on these lists. And I feel like that speaks to kind of a larger theme of strategies in the industry. It's antiquated thinking. It's like the childhood, like utopian dream. It's like sort of the MFA program teaches you that that is like a barometer of good work and you know quality writing but nope. you know if you if you look at what is actually on the lists for the most part other than our book unfuck your brain which obviously <laughs> is the best book on the list it's by and large people that have way too much money way too many resources you know i mean 
And you'll see sometimes where people will get dinged because it's like obviously on there by fraud, even if they have actually achieved the numbers to justify it, they have worked the system. Because honestly now it was such a key point of marketing for so long that many you know, businesses would create a way to game the system. Yeah, like uh, Donald Trump Jr.'s book mm -hmm. recently was on the New York Times bestseller list, but the New York Times had a big caveat that they're like, this reflects many uh, bulk and institutional purchases that maybe yeah. were not done by people connecting the book with readers, but were done by people connecting the author with this list. And, and there's a similar function where you can use, um, you can pay Forbes to use their name and, and put their brand on the back of your book. And in interviewing with the people that run this program, they essentially admitted that the way this works is that so many of the kind of people that have the money to do that also have a institution behind them that will buy hundreds of thousands of copies to like distribute to homeless children in Zimbabwe or to like pass out to their employees or to otherwise create the illusion of success for the book in an effort to promote the book, you know? But again, it just generally points to like the larger failing of publishing, which is that you need to have so much money to establish that modicum of success. And that is still no guarantee at all that you will sell a legitimate copy to a person that is interested in it. So I, now we've torn these lists to shreds. I don't know, I think they're pretty cool. Yeah. Ellie is not convinced. I'm not. You could try harder. You could either try to convince me harder to love these lists. These lists are great! Or offer a brief summary of the alternate marketing strategy that you would suggest to the non-billionaires among us. Wait, oh. I see. You're not a billionaire? Not yet. Okay, good to know. We just need to sell a few more billion copies of that book. So I'm going to bring you right back to Unfuck Your Brain, which we published two and a half years ago. Actually, it is funny, the question for the podcast this week was, what publicity strategy did you use to land on Fuck Your Brain on the Wall Street Journal bestseller list? To which I said, I don't think we did. No. We, what we did do is we developed the book, we developed the packaging to make it clear that it communicates what the book is, and I swear the same thing we say on the podcast every single week. What we did do is we made a book that people want and we brought it to the audiences that wanted it. We had zero high profile reviews of this book. The first review of this book was a college newspaper tearing it to shreds because they did not like the tone of the book. You know, if we were launching it with any kind of coherent strategy, we would have sent it, you know, to, you know, it would have even been, it wasn't even reviewed in Publishers Weekly or, you know, Library Journal or places that more or less would review this book because of what it is. Instead, we really went for the low bars. And what we did do is we brought it to a lot of conferences and we helped to organically reach the audience that cares about it in the way that, like, even my friends that only really know sort of peripherally what I do had heard of the book and were familiar with it and thought it was cool and were surprised and impressed that it was us. And so, you know, that works because it results in people tweeting about the book, people interacting with other people and recommending the book. And, you know, that is like what they call buzz in the industry. <laughs> and this book had buzz. Has all, all it has is buzz mm -hmm. and a good book. Right, but that is sort of a good book is the product, well, buzz is the product of a good book. That's true. Is a good book the product of buzz? Buzz is, mm -hmm. buzz is the opposite of the bestseller list. So buzz is kind of the publishing version of go viral. Do people still say that? I don't know. Seems doubtful. We're old now. We don't Can we get YouTube to come out and film this? YouTube, help us be a little more hip. <laughs> <laughs> If we're not beyond <laughs> salvaging. I do have some insight into the mechanics of how this got on that list. So there's a major online retailer that we have made a big deal about not doing business with anymore. Ebook distributor does sell our ebooks to them. And there was a data mix up and we were not doing that, which meant we were eligible for a giant promotion where they 
were able to like put copies of this book on super sale for uh, as an ebook for a short period of time and apparently that boost is what got us onto that list so as usual all of microcosm's successes are a product of other people's mistakes <laughs> in grand summary also we will make we and the author will make almost no money from this placement because all of the sales are at such an extreme discount. I think it was like a third of the usual ebook price. Oh, okay. So but that's still pretty good. It wasn't like a dollar. It wasn't ninety nine cents. I think it was one ninety nine or two ninety nine. Right. And the book the ebook is normally thirteen ninety nine, so it was okay, it was an extreme discount. Okay, yeah. So you know, and that was kinda of what I that was kind of the talk I had with the author where I was like you'll probably get the same amount your the amount you earn in royalties will probably be the same as any other month but the number of books read will probably be 100 times what it is in a normal month and who knows maybe all of those readers or at least some small percentage of them will go out and seek out her other books we can hope so time will tell and she has lots of other books so in summary thank you for watching so launch your book any other way and if people like it you'll get on the list two and a half years after publication. Well, I or don't feel want, like any and it doesn't matter. of those are connected. <laughs> uh, thank you for watching the Cynical Guide to Publishing. That's how you succeed. Where we pluck the bloom off the rose for you. I am Joe Beal, uh, the displaced former host of uh, this podcast, <laughs> autistic publisher and author of A People's Guide to Publishing. I'm your new host, Ellie Blue. I'm the author of all of our books. And I'm in charge of everything. Must be nice. It's actually a pretty big burden. I'm ready to start delegating. Wait, stay tuned for next week where we get to episode 42, the answer to life, the universe, and everything. Thanks so much for joining us once again on A People's Guide to Publishing, the podcast. I am your host, Joe Beal, the autistic publisher. I'm Ellie Blue, the editor who doesn't pay attention to commas. And please send us your questions so we can answer them on future episodes. Uh, and please, please do give us those reviews on iTunes and everywhere else that podcasts are reviewed. Five stars, if you please. And have a wonderful week. Thank you. You can find us on the internet at microcosmpublishing.com or microcosm.pub if you want to keep it short and simple. You can also find us on Twitter at microcosm, on Facebook at microcosm publishing, on Instagram at microcosm underscore pub, and here in Portland on North Williams Avenue. Thank you so much.